Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining. Thanks especially to our regular listeners and to our new listeners. Uh, my name is Ari Zuckerman, Vice President of Center Court Sports Academy. Um, our goal for the Center Court webinar series is to keep valuable information flowing to the international and to the local tennis community, to keep all of you engaged, and to create ideas throughout the, these tough times. Um, today's main focus is going to be on essential athletic foundations for performance tennis. Um, our special guest is Dr. Mark Kovacs. Um, Dr. Mark is a high performance expert, sports technology consultant, performance uh, psychologist, researcher, professor, author, speaker, and coach with an extensive background training and researching elite athletes. He is known as the go-to expert for elite and professional athletes, corporate executives, and performance artists looking for science-based programming to optimize human performance. Um, he was also recently hired by the Cleveland Cavaliers as the Senior Director of Sports Science and Health. Um, so congratulations to him for that. Joining us as well is my regular guest, legendary coach Conrad Singh, who is the COO, Director of Coaching, and Head of Performance at the Center Court Sports Academy. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. So my first question is, um, again, for both of you guys, have you been uh, keeping busy these last few days for Conrad, weeks for... Uh, uh, for Dr. Kovacs, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, get going with the other questions. Sure thing. So first off, excited to be here. Thank you guys for what you're doing, keeping people engaged uh, while everyone's at home. Uh, so you know, the last couple of weeks, you know, has been pretty busy for me, which has been good. It's the way I sort of like it. It keeps my mind active, keeps the body active. Um, staying engaged in, you know, the, the basketball world, as you mentioned, is a big part of what I do now, but also very heavily in the tennis community and, you know, just trying to keep up with friends, colleagues, um, talking to a lot of different folks that, you know, like everyone going through some challenging times, trying to figure out what's next and trying to just brainstorm and, you know, really provide a community where people can talk through ideas because there is no playbook for what we're going through. No one's been through this before. There isn't easy answers to any of these questions. And it's just trying to provide resources where we can talk through it and try to make the best decisions possible. So, Dr. Mark, uh, absolute honour to have you here with us tonight, mate. More than anything, having another Australian from Melbourne is exciting. Um, what, I, what I really would love for you to tell us, if you don't mind, is just a brief um, snapshot of basically your background and how you've come to be uh, the global leading expert in this area. Yeah, so I started playing tennis in Australia, grew up, um, you know, playing competitive international tennis, you know, traveled all over the world from a pretty young age, playing junior slams, junior tournaments, things like that. Came to college in the US, played at Auburn, you know, first rule of doubles is pick a good partner, was fortunate enough to win the NCAA title in doubles, then played professionally for a short period, uh, and then uh, got into the whole world of sports performance, sports science, uh, went into the research world, wanted to understand the questions of why are we doing what we're doing. Um, so worked at IMG Academy as a strength coach in my very young days, uh, then got an opportunity to work with the US Tennis Association, head up their sports science, strength and conditioning and coaching education areas, um, and still do a lot of work with USDA player development and USDA in general. Uh, and so that's, you know, the passion is tennis, of course, and been in that world most of my life. Then had an opportunity to work with Gatorade, directed the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. And that exposed me to a lot of other sports, worked with the Brazil national team in the World Cup, uh, worked with a lot of Major League Baseball teams, worked with some EPL soccer teams, worked with the MLS. Uh, and then after that, set up our own institute in Atlanta, where we sort of combined those areas, worked with a lot of different sports, still heavily involved in tennis and got into the whole sport technology environment, wearables, researching of that, working with a bunch of startups, dealing with how do we improve athletic performance? How do we improve executive performance and how do we reduce injuries as well? That's so interesting. Um, I do recall you actually being a junior back in Melbourne, Australia, and to see your pathway to here is just outstanding. Um, as you know, you, you've known Center Court a long time. You know Clay very well. Um, we have a lot of very good performance juniors, and I'm always interested in them for them to understand. You know, of course, there is the the college pathway, and then into the professional world, there is the obviously professional pathway. But then there's the pathway where you go down still keeping sport in your life. And, and, you know, I find that that area is so broad. No one really talks too much about it. Um, it's obviously gratifying. How do you, I mean, do you feel fortunate 
at these times to be in this industry, even though we're struggling at this minute? Um, do you feel fortunate to be working with athletes day in, day out? Yeah, so first off, you know, I've had a relationship with Senecord for over a decade, um, you know, from the, basically the beginnings and we have been on, on site there multiple times, run USTA camps there. So phenomenal facility, phenomenal people and, you know, keep up the great work first off. But yeah, from it's kind of interesting how careers develop and, you know, it, I was never really wanting to be a, a full-time tennis coach. It was not the where I wanted to be I wanted to be a strength coach that was kind of after I stopped playing that's kind of the world I got into and then I was away from tennis for a few years after I stopped playing I wanted nothing to do with the sport and I sort of got pulled back in slowly over about three or four year period and you know then you you realize how much you miss it and that's why it's really nice now that you can still stay engaged you know, so many people from all over the world I'm connected with through tennis, through the various associations we're involved with. And it's just very fortunate that you can work with athletes uh, at different levels, not just the best. I've worked a lot with professional athletes, but I also really enjoy working with uh, recreational athletes, juniors, players that are just looking to improve. And that's the biggest thing. As long as you're looking to improve, you know, it, it's, it's a fun process to go through that. So we're definitely fortunate to be in this industry, working with these folks. And really, there's a lot of really good people. That's the biggest thing is you notice when you get in these, some of these other industries, you know, it, it's different. And tennis has a close knit community. Folks are really helpful. They're w really willing to go out of their way to help their colleagues and other people. So everyone involved, just thank you. Oh, that's um, amazing. Uh, Ari, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. To, to, I mean, to touch on that, it's, and I mean, the fact that you've worked with juniors for so long, and we have probably mostly juniors and some of our, you know, members and actually people from all over the world, but I think a lion's share is going to be junior competitive players. Um, I'm sure they would want to know, you know, what you recommend them doing and, uh, you know, in this time and for the next few weeks. And, uh, you know, even even some, uh, you know, some, some, some great advice. I'm sure you have, you know, Fun yeah, no. What, what, what they, when they get back on the court, you know, regularly. Um, no, I think, I think the, this is a unique opportunity. It's like every opportunity is an ability to go left or right. You have an option. You have an option to get worse or you have an option right now to get better. And the, the players that will get better, and I say the same thing to the pros. I'm on, the, I'm on a call or Zoom meeting with a pro nearly every day because they're going through the exact same thing. They're not getting paid. They're not really training like they normally do. They don't have access to the same equipment, facilities, coaches even. And it's like, what do you do? Sit on the couch, watch a bunch of Netflix and get worse? Or do you actually say, what are the areas I can work on? From a mental standpoint, from a strategy standpoint, from a physical standpoint, and even from a technical standpoint, there's a lot of things you can do to work on your game right now. And there are players that are taking advantage of that and getting better right now. And then there are players that aren't. And it's going to be real interesting. The first three to six months back after this, you're going to see a shift in power. You're going to see players that were average become really good. And you're going to see players that were pretty good drop a level or two based on what they're doing during this period. So it's one of those opportunities. Every player out there needs to look themselves in the mirror and be like, where do I want to be in six to nine months from now? And the, your daily work at the moment is going to dictate that. So from a really simple standpoint, work on your weaknesses as much as you can right now. It's the number one thing you can do because there's no, there's no negative to it because you're not competing, you're not playing tournaments, you've got nothing that is going to hurt you. If you've got to do a, a change, if you've got to add strength, if you've got to change a technical issue, do it right now. There's zero negative to doing it right now because there's no competitive pressure that you have to be under. Like if, if, if uh, as, a, as a follow up to that, Conrad, sorry, we're sorry to, sorry to cut you off. But like, let's say, let's say you were, you know, you, you were, you know, one of, one of the professionals training. How would you like kind of go about, about your day? You know, I, I know we're all kind of figuring out some new routine that we're trying to get into, whether it's, um, you know, you work out in the morning, you work out at night, you know, your meals and all that. You know, what, what, what would, I mean, what would, I mean, what do you think is kind of like the ideal day for, for, for a top 10 player or somebody that's training for high school tennis? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's similar. The volume may be a bit different, but the general concepts are going to be similar. Get as much sleep as you possibly can right now. That's number one. It's, it's rare that you're going to be able to get eight to 10 hours all the time in a normal lifestyle. So try to push that as much as you can. Um, no need to get up super early. 
um, you know, right now because you've got that extra time. So that's the first thing, you know, then make sure your nutrition is built into your day appropriately. Don't randomly kind of just eat when you feel like it, structure it, have it formalized so you can make sure that you're fueled right for your workouts. Uh, so that's two. So that's got nothing to do with tennis. That's just life. Just, you know, fuel your, yourself and sleep, which is your recovery time. So get those two pieces, you know, locked in and don't change them. That's important right now because you got to have some consistency and then you build your day around that. Okay. How much school are you going to do? Block out your times that school's important. How much technical work are you going to do? Whether it's hitting against the wall, whether it's on a, depending on what you've got access to, you may shadow swings, whatever it is, you're going to block off your time for that. Then your physical components, you're going to block your time off. Then your strategy and mental, you're going to block it all off and then figure out is the percentage right for what you need to work on. Some players may need extra technical work. So that's 30% of their total training day. Other players may need less of that and 30 to 40 or 50% is physical. So it's not a one size fits all, but it's how do you strategize your day? That's the important part. And that's what the good pros are doing and they're committing to it. And they're looking at this as a great opportunity. Um, so it's the same thing if you're a high school player, how do, how do you structure your life? So when you come out of this, you're better, you're not worse. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic information. Um, Mark, we've had already uh, Dr. Anthony Ross, we've had um, Mr. Nick Boletari, Craig O'Shaughnessy, a few names that I'm sure you know very well. Every, we've asked everyone the same question and they've all kind of highlighted that this is the perfect time for mental skill development uh, and that there are umpteen ways to be able to do that. If you were to give just a handful of tips on what players could do or parents even to become better at, at assisting their kids, what would they be at this time? Yeah, so there's a few things on the mental side, especially is, you know, one is routines. Everyone knows how important routines are. The problem with routines is most people don't practice them consistently enough. They understand they need them, but they don't have them down. So this is the time when you want to practice the routines as much as possible. Understand visualization. Visualization is probably one of the most underutilized tools that everyone can do. And again, visualizing your, your technique. There's studies that have been done on other sports as well as tennis that when people don't actually physically practice their sport, but visualize, um, they can actually get better without ever hitting a ball. It's amazing. There's been some studies in golf that have done this and their actual handicap has come down, even though they've never hit a golf ball during this period, they just visualized. So it's really, really important that you use those times, play two sets in your mind every day you serving, you returning, you playing your patterns, you doing what you know you need to do and see yourself doing it really well. So those are some things that should be implemented all the time. Then also relaxation and stress relieving techniques because most players don't handle their emotions very well. I mean, no one really does, honestly, when, it, when you're truly under pressure. The, the best ones find strategies that make them better than most everyone else. So you've got to work on those strategies right now. So those would be some initial tips to get people started during this period. And if you're a parent um, right now, I mean, our parents at Santa Court, they're incredible, very supportive, um, very involved. Uh, we run a very large UTR league. So all our players are competing. Um, that's something that we make mandatory part of the program. Is there anything you could give parents that they may use this time to be able to understand the game better or assist their own children to prepare better? Yeah. So the biggest thing is really try to make sure that you're aware of what your player is working on based on what their coaches are telling them. These are the three or four things they're trying to get better at and then help them in those areas. Because the challenge for a lot of parents and, uh, you know, is there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of good information, a lot of misinformation, and it's challenging. Be careful about trying to get a lot of your information from 20 different sources. It's confusing. It, it, it's not that anyone's trying to give you bad information. It's just how it's delivered. It may not be appropriate for your player your individual coaches that you work with on a daily basis are the best people to get your resources from because they understand what they're working on. They understand your player. And it's really important having singular voices 
and very small teams around a player is much better than having multiple voices coming from everywhere. It's not that anyone's meaning anything badly by looking for other sources. It's just, it, it gets confusing. And I've seen, unfortunately, too many times at the junior level and at the pro level where this derails a player's development because they're trying too many things. They see this on YouTube or they hear this comment from a coach over here, or they get this idea from another parent. And all of a sudden you're trying 17 different things. And the coach had three simple things they just wanted to work on with that player. And if they would have stuck to those three things, the player would have got a lot better. So that's one big thing that I always say is be careful about taking in too much information. You, you, the good thing about your parents is they're at a trusted resource with quality coaching, quality people. They know they're getting good information. Make sure they listen to that information. That's great. That's really great information right there. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in today's tennis, um, as I said, a lot of the kids are competing. Is there a balance um, in terms of athletic development, understanding the development window and age sort of group, is there a balance you think of enough training um, versus competition or the balance between off court, on court, once things are all ready to go again, what would you sort of recommend? Yeah, so this has been a big area that I've been involved with from a research standpoint and trying to help developmental athletes all the way from about an eight-year-old who's starting to get some competency and just hitting the ball over and moving all the way up to the pros. And what does that pathway look like? How much? And everyone, of course, is a little bit different, but there are some relatively consistent aspects to what's needed. At the younger ages, you need a lot more basic fundamental skills. Can they jump? Can they land? Can they throw? Can they hop? All the fundamental movements that aren't necessarily that tennis specific. They need to be able to just do everything and be competent at everything. And then their tennis technique the technical side of hitting a ball needs to be prioritized. You need to get your grips right, your swing paths right, contact points correct. Then, then you start shifting into more of the tennis-specific physical side of things where once the athleticism base is somewhat okay, they just know how to handle their body. Then we start focusing significantly on, you know, do they move on the tennis court the most efficient way possible? You know, and that's where it, it's rather technical, just like stroke development is tennis footwork and tennis movement and tennis technique from that perspective needs to be prioritized. So how that breaks down, normally you want to do, you know, about 50 to 70% of your time, you know, needs to be of course on technique, on court, hitting, things like that. But you have 50, you know, 30 to 50% of your time should be on off court related stuff. And most players don't do that. Most players are 80, 90% on court hitting and maybe 10 or 20% off court. But if you really want to be a high-level college player, a high-level player that may have some desires to play at the highest levels, you need to make sure the physical capabilities are developed because that's a separating factor. There's plenty of players in college that hit a great ball. If you go to any college and you go watch them play, you'll be like, man, they hit the ball well. And they do. They just don't move very well out of the corners. They don't recover well. They're inefficient in their step counts. And then the mental side is usually another piece that they're just – lacking a little bit so you have to make sure you understand what's going to get you to the uh, end zone that you're trying to get to it's similar to golf you know a lot of people talk about the importance of putting if you want to be a great golfer um, but people don't spend that much time practicing putting they, they spend way more time on irons and driving and all the other areas which are important but if you don't putt well you're never going to make money in golf it's the same thing in tennis. If you don't have the physical skills down and at a super high level, it doesn't matter how well you hit the ball. You're, you're not making it out of the gates at, at, at a really high level. Fantastic. I think that's what, uh, that's, what, that's what Craig discussed is how a lot of juniors go out and they just hit balls rally back and forth where obviously, you know, most points are won on, you know, shorter points to serve, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. So, so um, to piggyback on that, what, you know, you work with a lot of, I guess, you know, professional tennis and, and like you said, soccer and, and basketball players. What, what are some of the main, you know, characteristics of, 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 of the best of the best? Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an important question and it's very consistent. They all have unbelievable abilities to decelerate. That's if you're going to pick one physical capability that they do better than anyone else, it's the ability to stop. 
It's not the ability to start. Most people can start. It's the ability to stop and then recover. So that's wide balls. That's deep balls. That's, you know, short balls where they have to land, stop, and then you know, do change direction. So if you look at any sport, soccer, basketball, you know, volleyball, whatever sport it is, the athletes that decelerate the best uh, have the best results from a physical standpoint. The reason being is any sport that requires change of direction, which tennis requires hundreds, sometimes even thousands, if you play a five set match of changes of direction and you need to be able to stop and reaccelerate. And unfortunately, most players don't work on that enough. And, you know, they're so focused on their first step or their split and then first movement, which is important, no doubt, but that only gets you one shot. Most points require one, two, three, four, five shots. So you have to be able to, you know, reaccelerate after you're st- slowing down. Mark, similar um, to what you were saying a moment ago about putting in golf is the serve in tennis. We all know that. Um, it's that it's that shot that everybody wants to really accelerate on, but I question how much a lot of people really spend time to understand the key components to the serve. So we know that that's one of your absolute uh, genius areas. Is there anything you could highlight our kids that they could do whilst not having access to a tennis court per se, um, that they could do at home or anything technically that you could kind of generalize that they should be focusing on? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And the serve is, it's the number one stroke in the game. It's the most important stroke in the game. There's no sort of argument about that. And, you know, if you want to be good, getting a good serve is going to get you there the quickest. Uh, you can be have some limitations in other areas and still do okay if you serve really well. Um, so the biggest things they can do, especially right now, is the loading stage of the serve is probably, if you're going to pick one stage of the serve that needs more work in most players, is loading correctly. If you load correctly, that's the trophy position type scenario, that's vital. And so you can practice that. It's normally your back leg. So if you're a right-hander, it's going to be your right leg. You want to develop the ability to jump off that leg, twist into that hip. So developing mobility in that right hip meaning that you've got good internal hip range of motion is important. And then the second is being able to jump off that leg effectively. So doing a lot of hops and jumps off that leg. So that's from a physical standpoint. That's something you can work on. Then from a a little bit more of a technical perspective, throw a ball, go into your yard, go into the front street, wherever you've got access. All you have to do is throw the ball basically straight up as high as you can. That's a movement that most people don't practice. When they throw, they throw too much like a baseball, like a line drive. You don't want to throw that way very much because you open up your shoulders too early. It's not very specific to serving. Throwing up as high as possible keeps your side on longer and it gets you on that trajectory like you would do. So you want to throw up with a little bit of a forward lean, similar to how you would serve. So those are two things right now that everyone can practice and it'll help you surf. Unbelievable. Um, obviously, you, you're doing a lot of things in the world of sport. Uh, did you want to take us through any of your uh, websites, or any of your initiatives that you're involved in at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different things here. I'll share my screen so folks can kind of see um, a little bit what's, what's going on. Um, so let me go through it here. Let me see if you guys will see this. Does that come up there? Perfect. Yeah, so this is our academy site. This is our online educational portal. It's 100% on tennis. Um, We've got a bunch of different stuff here. If you go to this site, up here, there's a search bar right in there. Um, Search by anything, you know, forehands, backhands, movement, technique, all sorts of stuff. We have, you know, three or 400 hours of content on here, all searchable. This is our latest post. You can kind of see the types of stuff we have up here. You know, should you play with a lighter or a heavier racket? It's a discussion. You know, uh, we've been going through, a lot of players ask that question. Movement and footwork. We've got some different podcasts, different webinars, different things up there, some technical things. Some of this stuff's free. Our blog, if you go up here to the blog, that area is 100% free. And then we have a membership site as well if you want to get into more details with what's going on. So that's kovacsacademy.com. You know, a lot of stuff's there. The free membership gets you a bunch of stuff. And then if you really want to get into depth, there's a, there's a paid option as well. Uh, and that probably for players um, is one of the best options they have available. 
Uh, we also have an app on the App Store, and that's really designed for players. Um, so if you're on the App Store, it's just called go to Kovacs Tennis um, and take a look at that as well. So those are the two simple options. Um, then we have more in-depth things that are related to long-form courses and things like that. So uh, if people are looking at that, then you may want to go to our Institute page, which has a few different things. Um, this is Kovacs Institute. And if you go on here, we have assessment options for players that want to get assessed in detail. We have our courses up here, you know, all sorts of different things on movement, on taking care of your arm and hips and various things like that. So those are a few different options. There's a bunch of stuff on Instagram as well. If anyone's on Instagram, Kovacs Institute, we put up a bunch of free stuff daily on there. Um, a lot of different things going on. So also if people want to reach us, you know, at Kovacs Institute on Twitter and Facebook as well. So that's the easiest ways to get hold of us. We have a bunch of different things going on and, you know, happy to connect. That's absolutely great. Um, oh, you touched on something just then that I, I think is absolutely essential. Uh, and that is the screening, the, um, you know, whether it be musculoskeletal or general physical screening, um, how important is that and at what age do you think kids who are on court, remember our performance players, they're on court at least 10, 8, 10 hours a week. So, and a lot of them are doing a lot more than that. So what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, screening is just understanding someone, you know, whether you call it testing, screening, assessments, it's all in the same family. And if you don't know where an athlete, whether it's tennis or any other sport, has strengths, and has weaknesses or opportunities, how are you designing your program? So you, you're, you're guessing is really what's happening. So we don't wanna guess, we wanna know, okay, is this person jump really high? Do they have great explosiveness? Are they stiff in their right hip? Do they have a tightness in their shoulder that if we don't deal with that could result in impingement and then injury in a year or two? All of these things is why you assess. You don't assess necessarily um, with a, a goal in mind, you're assessing to figure out how to set your goals. So it's really, really important to do assessments regularly. We do them very, very regularly with the players we work with. And a lot of the time they're simple. Um, we'll do more in encompassing ones a few times a year, a few times per year to get some baselines and then to show improvement. But we'll do some type of testing or assessment weekly to make sure that they're progressing on the right path. So if, if players aren't doing some form of assessment, they, it's, you got to ask, well, how are you deciding then what to work on? Yeah, we also have um, within our programs, uh, one, one of the three hours of training daily is on uh, physical conditioning. Oh, of course, yeah. um, and obviously that's tailored at the different levels and different groups that we have, different ages and levels. Um, a lot of players, to be honest, if they were going to select an hour that they were not available to be there for homework reasons or whatever the other reasons are, legitimate reasons, it would be physical that they would opt out of as opposed to the, you know, two hours on court. What do you think about that at the young ages? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that, that's a little short-sighted because the problem is if your physical capabilities aren't being developed, especially at those younger ages, you can't really make that up later on. It's not something that you don't do it for four years and then say at 17, I'm going to start training physically and I'm going to be okay. You've missed a window of opportunity there that you don't get back. So you want to understanding everyone's got time restraints and logistical issues. But if you're trying to be a really high level competitive tennis player, you need to prioritize those areas. It's just as important as the tennis skill side, because each year you get older, the physical skills that you need become more important. At a younger age, you can get away with less physical skills and still win some matches because the speed of the game is not as fast. The strategy is not as good. The, the positioning on the court is a bit narrower. You don't have to cover as much court. But each year you get older, the speed of the game picks up, the strength of your opponents pick up, you're going to be left behind. So it's very short-sighted to drop that as a priority at the young age because you don't get the immediate return which is true. You don't, you don't see the immediate return that next week by the physical work you're doing. You see the immediate, you see the return in three months and six months in a year, in two years. So it's really important, especially the parents out there. Think about this as a multi-year plan. It's not a one month plan or a two month plan. 
It's, hey, we've got to get our player from, you know, elementary school to junior high, to high school, to college. It's, you've got to plan through those cycles. And physical is just as important in most respects as the on-court side. So you've got to find a way to make it work. And if you want to be really good, if you don't want to be really good, then that's like, every, then you'll, you, you do what you do and you'll get left behind. And that's, I've seen it thousands of times across the country and across the world where these really good 12s and 14 year olds start to get beaten up on when they hit the 16s because they haven't prioritized the physical side. Right. Um. I have a couple good questions here. One from a gentleman named Stephen Walters. It's same, same topic. He's he wants to know what the um, what the encore core training ratios are for beginner, intermediate, high performance, or professional players. You know, uh, you know. I know some some people. I guess I think Federer is one who's who's known for doing most of his training off court. I'm sure there's other players like that, but but if yeah. there's you know a certain ratio, the, like what's your the, recommendation for? So we track this actually. We track this at USGA with our uh, elite players and and your all the way through from a literally a 10 to 12 year old, once they start committing to say, Hey, I want to be a really good tennis player. And then you track how many hours do you spend? And it's, it's interesting. It's 80, 20 or so when they're really young, like 10, 11, right. 12, 80% on court, 20% right. physical. And it shifts about 10% a year, you know, give or take. So by the time they get to 17, it's 50, 50 or even sometimes 60, 40 on the physical. And then once they get to the pros, it's sometimes 80, 20 off court to on court. And like you said, Federer, the Joker Richards of the world, the, the, the older players, once they're, you know, late twenties, early thirties, they understand if my body breaks, it doesn't matter how good I hit the ball. I can't yeah, make money. Know. I can't compete. And so they over prioritize their body at that point, because that's, that's their weakest link, unfortunately. Um, so it shifts rapidly. So you go from 80, 20 to 20, 80 by the end of your professional career. That's interesting. So I guess starting out, yeah, starting out, you know, it's, it's, it's more awkward. Obviously you got to develop your technical skills and then, and then uh, once you have those down, everything becomes, you know. Yeah. So as a rule of thumb, I always use a 10% a year type of rule. And again, that's a ballpark. It could be, you know, 15%, it could be 8%. It just mm -hmm. gives you a good rule of thumb to say, okay, 80, 20 to start with, you know, about 10, 11, kind of when you start committing to it, playing it at a higher level. And then each year after that, add 10% more on the physical side. And that'll get you sort of to 50-50 by the time you're 16, 17, that type of framework. Mark, we were talking up before we came on about, um, I, I was once um, at one of the world presentations where you discussed the specificity of training tall athletes. Um, I found that very interesting because it's obviously, you got to look at it a completely <laughs> different way. Is it the same for short athletes? Is it, I mean, talk a little bit about that, the independence, because we don't have, really have two players that are the same. Yeah, no, and that's the great part about the sport of tennis is you have all sorts of sizes that can be successful. And that's really, really great about the sport. Um, I've been unique. Uh, I've worked with John Isner and with Riley Opelka, the two oh. tallest players in the yeah. history of the game, basically. Um, so I think I can speak on the subject reasonably well because, you know, they've got unique aspects and they're different. You know, Riley's dad played basketball at, at Alabama, really good athlete. Riley's got a very different body type, even though they're about the same height. Right, their bigger. body shape is a bit different. So yeah. working with them and also Riley worked on the physical side of training from a very young age. And he was working on that at 14, at 15, at 16. John, and he'll tell you this, he, he didn't do a lot of physical work till he got to college. Um, so very different backgrounds, which, you know, resulted in different playing styles and all sorts of different things. So the thing about tall players is you, their feet, uh, their limiting factor many times. You have to do a lot of extra work on their feet because it's a, it's a real risk area because they, you know, they're supporting so much extra weight and so much, and their levers are different. So you do a lot of different things from that standpoint. You also can't necessarily do things that you would do with a smaller player, meaning that they can't squat as low. They don't have, because of right. their limbs and how they're designed, it's very difficult for them to get in those positions. It's actually dangerous sometimes to squat them as low like you would someone who's smaller um, based on their hip structure and things like that. So there's a lot of things you have to be careful about when you're tall 
that smaller players can work on that taller players can't and vice versa then because their game style is going to be shorter points. I mean, it, everyone knows that their game style is built around serving and built around shorter points. So how you train them on an endurance perspective is very, very different. You don't have them go run. I mean, if you're having a tall guy go run three miles, you're setting yourself up for some injury. You know, so you're doing a lot of short sprints. You're doing a lot of unloaded work in the pool, in sand, things like that. Whereas a shorter player that you know they're running all day, they're going to be on the baseline and they're going to be playing longer points a little bit and they're going to kind of have to be in that world of a little bit more defensive kind of tennis. You, you need them to run. And you don't have to have them run three miles necessarily, but they're going to be running at a lot more kind of distances than a taller player. And it's just specificity, that's all. It's not necessarily that they're taller is the issue. It's what are the things that because they're taller, do you have to make it more specific to them? Very interesting. Um, I was uh, reading recently that um, you'd done a, a research article. I think Jorge may have brought this up as well. Um, it was something like 70% lateral movement, 20% forward movement, and 10% backward movement. I might be out a little bit. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, is that the same with juniors? Do you know? Is it? Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit different in juniors. You have a little bit forward and back movement at the youngest ages, you know, because their depth perception isn't as good. Some balls are higher, so they have to run back further. So there's a little bit more moon balling type of tennis. So at a younger age, it's a little bit more forward and back and a little less lateral. As you get a better level, a higher level, it becomes much more lateral side to side. And when we say lateral, you're still on a bit of a diagonal, you know, those shuffle steps and things, that's still considered lateral. The forward and back is you're running to the net or you're, you're kind of sprinting back where you're covering a lot of court. So a majority of movements are diagonal and lateral. You combine those kind of in one zone, um, which, you know, most people see at the pro level. But the junior level is a little bit different because of the height of the ball and there's a little extra time. That's, that's great. I've got one more question I wanted to ask you if I could, Dr. Mark. That is, a lot of kids uh, in our age band are going through in this developmental window, they're going through technical changes. There's always that debate. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a major point of difference of our Center Court Academy programs is we prioritize competition. We really believe that competition playing helps to develop the athlete in multiple areas. Um, however, there's always that question, someone going through a technical change, be it a serve or be it a, you know, a forehand swing, back, back swing shape adjustment or a grip adjustment, how long should they stay out of competition or should they go out of competition? Or is it that that kid is able to uh, play a match and you know, not take it too much to heart and it's still a good thing for them? What's your opinion on that? Yeah. So first off, I'm very glad to hear you prioritizing competition. This sport and all sports are merit-based. You have to win to get better. I mean, to move up in rankings and everything. Yeah. That's how the sport's built. You have to compete. The best players at all levels learn how to compete by competing. That's, that, that's a skill in itself. And it's important. But you also have to realize if people overemphasize competition and not listen to what they're working on in practice. And that's the concern is a lot of the times coaches are working with players on, Hey, we're, we're trying to do this pattern or we're trying to work on this stroke or we're trying to do this different things. And then they go into a match and it looks like they don't even remember what they were trying to work on. They just go back to whatever's most comfortable in that moment. And that's the concern with playing too much competition. If you're working on a bunch of things. So you have to find that balance. And that's the question is, what is that balance for that player? And the players have to realize that the competition is there as a part of training, especially if it's internal, a lot of internal kind of competitions. So you have to use that time to practice what you feel uncomfortable in, knowing that your result may or may not be as good right now as if you go back to whatever's comfortable, but you're trying to work through it. But that means the environment needs to be created from the parents, from the coaches, from everyone involved in that player's team, that they understand that we may not get an outcome result the same today, but we're going to work on developing a skill set that in a week or a month, we're going to get a much better outcome because we're going to be better at it. But you have to create the environment where that's accepted. And so I don't like having people out for weeks at a time from competition to work on a technical adjustment. 
um, because most technical adjustments shouldn't take months. It's probably not the right adjustment or the player hasn't committed to making the adjustment, which is the other issue. You have to get the players buy-in. Sometimes coaches, me included, are like, we want to change something because we know it's better or it's more textbook, but the player hasn't bought into it. So we have to get buy-in from both ends. Otherwise, it doesn't work very well. So most adjustments should feel pretty good within a week or two at most. Shouldn't take longer than that to at least get back into some competitive environments. May not be the same level. You know, it may, let's say you're a UTR 11, you may drop down and play a UTR 9 type of level for a, a tournament or two while you're working through this adjustment. Doesn't mean you're not competing. It's just you're not going to go play against your UTR 11s in that event right now. You're going to drop down a level or two so that you can work on the right things, still be competitive, still probably get through and win those matches. Because um, no one should go into an event saying, I'm going to lose. I'm walking on this court and I know I'm going to lose, but I'm still going to do it. That isn't a good mindset either. So you've got to find that balance between create the environments where these technical changes or physical or what mental, whatever you're working on can actually be improved in a competitive environment. That's uh, so good that um, you've talked a little bit there inadvertently on scheduling and, and you know, tournament selection, uh, how many weeks training, how many weeks technical. That is just an absolute key to success. I think there've been countless numbers of players that I've seen over my years doing this that have maybe not got the results they could have got because they've selected either too high a level of competition too early or, you know, in some cases gone to the wrong level and lost to players that you know they're probably going to struggle against and that's hurt their confidence. How yeah, can, can I actually mention something on that? Because what you just brought up is probably, especially at the higher levels, one of the biggest missteps by parents and by coaches many times as well and by players is they don't understand what the winning percentages are of really good players. You know, in the juniors, the winning percentages are 70 to 80%. They're yeah. winning, you know, three or four matches for every time they lose. That's what really good juniors are doing, you know, right. and then they get to the pros and it's less than 50%, you know, once they get to the highest levels, but top juniors win four matches for every loss or three, three and a half matches for every loss. Whereas most juniors and most probably people on this are saying, if you look back over the last year, you're maybe 50%. You may have a losing record. That probably means your scheduling is incorrect because you're playing too high a level right now for where you're at. Great point. I like that. I have, I have one on while we're on the match play topics of competing. Um, Obviously, everybody experiences pressure in different ways, but uh, but um, one of our uh, one of our listeners is asking if you experience if you experience pressure during a match or been thinking about a match before you play, what would you say is the best idea, or best coping mechanism to to deal with nerves, or how how do you kind of address that for for all the junior players who you know can't handle it or have problems handling just the nerve factor? I know that, that it happens at the highest level and at all levels. Yeah, no, it's 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 no different. Top players in the world, Federer gets nervous. You see it. When he gets nervous, man, that forehand goes into the stands. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, the guy's that him, good. Yeah. And, he, you know, his feet stop moving. And it's the same response that a 12-year-old will have. Um, there's, there's a couple of reasons. First off, you have to understand what we're talking about. Usually it's indecision. Indecision is what creates the pressure in most scenarios. You don't know what to do. Should I hit cross court? Should I hit down the line? Should I go for my first serve or should I roll it in? That's what creates that pressure most if in most scenarios whether it's sport business life indecision creates the problems so the quickest way to avoid that is to remove the indecision so you've got to have your simplest game plan possible for when that a moment arises if you're you know want to hit forehands you're going to hit every forehand possible and you're going to hit to the same spot as much as you can or if you know that you your best serve is your wide serve you're only going to hit wide serves until you feel a little better about yourself. One, your opponent doesn't know you're going to do that. That's what most people forget is your opponents in their own world most of the time. And unless you're playing at a super high level with a really skilled opponent that's actually paying attention, most of the time they're just worried about their side of the court. They're not paying that much attention to you anyway, which is the problem. But that's your advantage that you can have one or two simple plays that you go to in your most pressure moments when you feel like, hey, 
I, I feel my heart rate going. I feel like I'm starting to lose it. Let's just go to my best option, my best play. And as you get better and better and better, that's harder to do sometimes because your opponent probably knows that. They scout you. They do match analysis, things like that. But most people on this call, you're not at that stage yet. You know, so it's important to really make sure you've got one or two plays on your serve games and on your return games that you know is your go-to plays. That's, that's absolutely awesome. I'm um, just reading a quick question here, and it's actually one that um, I've often wondered. If you look at back at the old footage, Becker, Sabatini, Pat Cash, they would <laughs> land on their back leg. They would do a scissor-type movement, and they're, if it, say they're a right-hander, their back leg would become their front leg. The question from Steve Walters here is, if you were coaching one of them today um, and they were as proficient, I mean, as they were, would you change that? Is that like a modern thing? Is that a biomechanical thing um, that today everybody sort of lands on their front foot being the left foot? Yeah, great question. And, and the reason those serves came about um, was because of the old rule. The, there was an old rule that required your front foot to be on the ground all the way till ball contact. So you couldn't actually jump off the front leg. That changed in the late 60s, early 70s. Forget the exact year, but there was a change there. So those players grew up with coaches that were still teaching that style. That was why that generation was the last to actually go through that. Since then, you haven't seen one person do that. Reason being is you, you open up a little bit early. Um, you also don't necessarily get as high. Um, you know, so you don't have the same angle of release potentially. So there are a few things biomechanically that aren't as efficient. But like you said, they had pretty proficient serves. Wouldn't say Sabatini or Cash had the greatest serve for their generation. Becker, of course, had a phenomenal right. serve. You know? um, but again, it's, there are some things there that, you know, were, they were able to get in the right positions, but it makes it harder because you over rotate too early. Um, so that's why you haven't seen really anyone since then do that. Another quick question I've got for you, Mark, um, coming from Kristen Hansen, <laughs> is the role of private lessons in a development plan um, for, for players. We talk about obviously being the, the private lesson factor, the clinic factor, the physical factor, and then the um, competitive factor, which is, you know, where your mental stuff can often get worked on really well. Um, what role do you see the private lessons playing in the development path of juniors? Uh, and how many privates should they take a week? Yeah, so private lessons, and it's all about how you define what a private lesson is as well. I mean, there are some structures from a logistics standpoint. It's 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, however you structure it time-wise. But it's more about what happens during that period. You know, that's where one-on-one -on -one engagement and involvement on a specific task is done. It could be forehand down the line. It could be we, we're improving your slice angle. It could be we're working on this pattern of play. That's what we're talking about when we're saying private. It's, it's, it's specific, intentional work on one or two areas that you're going to make sure you hone during that period. Most of the time, it's kind of like cluster-based training. You're clustering a time period to work on something. So that's vital. And it should happen as much as possible. The question is, how do you incorporate some of that into your group training sessions as well so that, so that it feeds off each other? Because you need the live ball environments of groups. You need the different heights, the different spins, the different things that come in that most of the group environments provide. It, but the time that is spent during those privates are huge and they're really, really valuable. But again, it, it may be used in different ways. So I always say as much as possible, but it has to be used right. It can't just be, hey, we're going to you know, hit 100, 200, 300 balls without really a focused intent. And that's where sometimes you know, you've got to make sure that your intention is correct from the coach, but more importantly from the player. The player has to completely walk onto that court saying, this period is about me, 100%. I have to bring my complete A game, intention, focus, desire, because I can get a lot better in this period if I do what I'm supposed to do. Let me ask one real quick. This is one I think if you ask 100 coaches, you get 100 different answers. Where, what's, what's your take on, on um, 
uh, you know, playing you know, multiple sports, sports outside of tennis, which sports would you recommend if you're just going to pick one or two outside of tennis? But, you know, kids, uh, you know, kids are obviously, um, for the most part, playing, you know, soccer and baseball, you know, during the spring. And, and you know, they have their kind of seasonal um, sports that they play until a certain age. And then there's some kids that just, you know, seven, eight years old, they might just play, you know, tennis five days a week. But, but just what, what's your take on, 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 you know, the multiple sport athlete and the benefits and, 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 um, and I guess non-benefits that, 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 it, uh, that it entails in regards to, you know, um, the, you know, their, their tennis uh, evolution. Sure. Yeah, no, no, it's a very important question and something that, you know, to me has some very simple answers to it. The first is everyone should be exposed to a lot of sports at a young age, you know, 10 and under age group, you know, as many sports as you can do. I usually use a, a minimum of six. You want to at least have an athlete try in a seasonal kind of environment, not one time, but like actually see if they can get proficient at about six different sports. Because then you'll get a sense of what they really like and what they don't like. And it's going to be very obvious. You know, they're, they're going to gravitate to sports that they really are good at and enjoy. One or the other or both. Hopefully it's both. You know, they're really good at and they enjoy it. So that's the first step. That's 10 and under kind of age group, give or take a year or two. But then like, when do you start specializing is the question. And that's really, I think, where a lot of this discussion goes. Most people, I think, would be in agreement, 10 and under, you don't really want or should specialize in, in any sport. There's no value in it at that age. You want to do a lot of whatever the child likes, but you want to expose them to other sports so they get full physical development at that age. So that's pretty important. And the research backs that up left and right. It's not even really much of a debate. Where the debate happens is like around 12-ish, give or take a year mm -hmm. or two, is that's when you better start deciding what you want to do. I mean, you have to, if you want, depending on what level. If you want to play at a college level, you can delay it a year or two. If you want to play at a pro level, I don't know how many people are watching that that's even on the radar, but if that's an objective, you know, people are 13 and they're, you know, winning major junior slams in the, in the women's game. So you're pretty much a pro at 13. So if you haven't started to commit to the sport at 12, that pathway starts getting harder and harder. It's mm. just, it's just the logistics of it and the environment. So you have to sort of ask yourself those questions is what level are we talking about and what do we want to do? And again, I just base it on data. I try very hard in this space not to give too many opinions because everyone has an opinion. Right. You want to base it on the data of what is realistic and what you're trying to accomplish. We know a lot of things about what it takes to be a top 100 player. I and mean, that's where I spent a lot of the research time. You, know, you have to be really good by 14. You have to be top 50 in the country by 14 to be a pro. You have to be in the mix. You don't have to be number one. You don't have to be number five. And you, know, you don't have to be top 10, but you have to be top 40, top 50 in the country at 14. And, you know, at 16, you really have to be top 10. You know, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of leeway there historically over the last 20 years. You know, everyone looks at outliers and says, so what about this diamond in the rough? And they always use the NFL as an example of this. That's because in an NFL, as long as you're a super athlete and you can run really fast, they can find a spot on defense for you. Right. you know, they'll find a spot for you if you're the best athlete on the field. Um, but in tennis, you've got the psychological piece, you've got the strategy piece, you've got the physical, you've got all of that. So that's just the realities of what we're talking about. But in general... You want to play multi-sports as long as possible, but you will also need to start spending more and more time on a sport if you want to be really good at it. I mean, there's, it's very hard to do it any other way. No, that, that's so good, so true. But Mark, I wanted to ask you, bringing it back a little bit to these times we're living, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the effects of the, the situation on potentially colleges, college sport, uh, etc. Do you want to expand a little on that? Yeah, no, we just know that with, with financial reductions that are going to happen everywhere because of what's happening, you know, colleges are getting hit just as hard as businesses are getting hit right now. So they're going to have to be making some uh, decisions. And we know that non-revenue sports are the first in line when any sports potentially get reduced or, or cut. It's just part of the economics of it. So there are going to be some programs that are going to have to make some tough decisions over the next year. Do they keep a program? Do they reduce number of scholarships? 
how is that going to look? So for folks that are looking at that right now, just pay attention, follow your programs, try to see what they're doing. They're going to be making their announcements probably by this, by the end of the summer, more than likely. Once they figure out what's going to happen with college football this year, that's probably going to be the, the major determining factor. They already lost out on college basketball, the, a lot of the revenue from that this year, which is a big hit. And then if college football really starts to struggle and they can't play it the way they're used to playing it and bring in the revenue from that, then decisions are going to have to be made. And it's just like every other business. They're going to look at, you know, the financials and determine what's bringing in revenue, what's not, what can we support? And some tough decisions will likely be made. It's going to be a little more competitive. I mean, most likely for less. Yeah, less and that's spot, also a really good point. Anyone that's looking at schools over the next two years, you may now need to widen your base of schools. So if you had five to ten schools you were looking at, they were your schools based on your UTR, based on your results, based on your location, based on whatever else you were using. That's going to shift. Your UTR is going to now whatever your UTR is now it probably has changed the schools that will be looking at you because they may be on a scholarship restriction for a year. They may not have the program possibly. We hope not. We hope that's not going to happen, but so you've got to widen your net of schools that you're looking at over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's I mean, great information for all the, you know, sophomores and juniors out there. Um, certainly. Um, let me see. I think, I mean, there's a ton more questions, um, but I think, Conrad, do you have any more? I think we're going to probably wrap it up. We've been going about an hour. I mean, it's un unbelievable information. This is all, um, this is all great stuff. And I know, I know the, the, the listeners have all been, you know, hugely supportive of our webinars. I'm sure they all um, really appreciate you being on, Mark. Um, Conrad, anything you want to, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, want I to think, ask before um, we finish up? I just up? wanted to, you know, personally, say thank you very much, Mark, for coming on. Um, you know, you're one of the most sought after experts on the planet right now in our sport. Your, your information is, is unbelievable. And I think everyone listening in could really benefit. I'm a member of the COVAX Institute um, site. I, I, the, the information is absolutely awesome. So I'm really a big fan at this moment in time for everyone to kind of become a student of the game and, you know, go back to basics a little more, watch a little more tennis, read a little bit more, you know, go through some PowerPoints and different things that are online right now. So uh, you're obviously, you were obviously a student of the game growing up. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was probably too much of a student of the game. It's amazing the stuff <laughs> I was enjoyed watching. I actually learned some of that from Mike Tyson because um, – it was interesting. I saw his documentary on Tyson when I was younger and it was about how he and Customato would watch early 1900s um, prize fights. And that's what they were studying. You know, they were studying how those guys would move and how they would anticipate and things like that. So growing up in Australia, we had a big history of great players from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So I would watch a lot of black and white tennis matches. You know, Lou Hode, Frank Sedgman, uh, Bromwich Quist, all these guys that were, you know, probably names most people don't have never heard of on this. But that was where I actually got a lot of my education from because not much has changed in tennis in 100 years when you actually look at the fundamentals. Style's changed, technology's changed. But when you look at the two feet before contact and two feet after contact, tennis is pretty similar. Strategy is pretty similar as well. It's not that different, you know, the way they play, how they try to, you know, take time, give time. Court surfaces are different, of course. They played a lot more on grass than now. So that changed how things were done. But there's a lot of things to learn. You go back and you look at Borg and how he played. You know, he changed the game. Lendl then changed the game again. You know, and you see these generational shifts. You know, Nadal changed the game completely when he came on board. So these generational shifts, uh, what we'd want to study. Not where tennis is today, but where it's going to be in the next decade. And what's that next generational shift? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 actually to follow up on that, I mean, where, where do you see, I mean, obviously, you know, the big three are getting old, a little older and there's the next generation. Is it faster, stronger? I mean, I'm just, I'm just really talking about I guess, I guess men's tennis, but women's Yeah, tennis. no, I mean, it's both. Oh, faster, One stronger, is, technology. Yeah. I mean, studying it more, more, more science, more, you know, just, you know, 
I don't know. I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, think? there's a few factors that you can't predict the future until you know what's going to happen with court surfaces and racket and string and ball technology, because right. that determines how people play. If they speed the courts up again, everyone's going to serve and volley again. It's serve pretty volley. simple. Yeah. It's not, it's not complicated, but until they do that, you know, you playing, you know, Nadal and Djokovic and Murray and even Federer play phenomenal defense. I mean, their defensive skills are why they've been at the top of the game for so right. long because the court yeah. surfaces are relatively slow. So if they sped everything up, you would have a different environment, which, you know, they made a conscious decision not to because of Ivan Isovic and Sampras, basically. You know, they, they didn't have to play that many long points. And so they shifted that from that standpoint. So the odds are they're going to keep courts probably similar. They kind of like this environment, how it's at. So you've got to figure out you're either going to be the best counterpuncture slash defensive athlete out there like a Djokovic and can do everything. Um, or you're going to have to play a completely different game with a huge serve like a Isner or an Opelka. Or you're going to have to come to the net a bunch. And that's the one question is who's that player that's going to find a way to be a attacking, you know, serve volley slash net rusher. It's going to be hard though, because of the string technology, they get the ball down so low with those net rushes now that it's right. really, really difficult. Um, but there is still going to be some folks that are going to come to the net more. Nadal's one of the best volleyers in the world. And mm -hmm. if you watched him in his first French that he won, couldn't volley to save his life. Now he's one of the best volleyers out there. And he's developed his game from beginning of the tour to now more than any player I've ever seen. Um, from the standpoint of he can hit his backhand as well as his forehand now, which his backhand was not very good when he came on tour. Couldn't really slice very well. Um, didn't have a serve at all. You know, rolled it in. Um, so it's, it's something that all the players should listen to. If Nadal every year finds a way to get significantly better, um, then we should, as players, all be looking to do that same thing year after year. No, I mean, I believe I read, I read also that um, that uh, Federer, like maybe I guess it was three or four years ago when he was trying to, you know, beat Djokovic. Djokovic beat him, you know, how many times in a row? He started, you know, gain some more speed on his backhand, gained a couple more miles an hour on his backhand, and then became a little more competitive. But you know, she exactly. If those guys are working on their game constantly, then. <laughs> But they have the mindset of they want to be the greatest of all time and they are built to say, I'm not going to let anyone beat me. Whoever's beating me now, I'm going to f solve that problem. And right. those best ones, that's all they cared about. You know, whether it's this generation, whether it was Sampras Agassi generation, they had three or four guys that they knew. If I was playing well, they could still beat me. I got to find ways to beat those players. Everyone else, they knew that if they played well, it doesn't matter who was on the other side of the net, they'd win. But there was always two or three guys that they knew, even if when I played my best, I still may lose to that person. And they had to solve that riddle. Yeah, well, Mark, we could go for hours and hours. I know <laughs> yeah, it would be awesome. Man, we cannot uh, thank you enough for the hour you've given us here. Um, so many thoughts. And I, I'm, I always know a good webinar when I leave with more questions. So thank right. you very much for that, Mark. Um, on my behalf of Senate Court, Tennis Academy, um, our, our viewers, Clay Bibby, we really appreciate your time. Next time you're up this way, please hit us up. We'd love you to come and see us and, uh, you know, get you out there and, and, and have a little bit of a chat. So thank you Appreciate much. it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, en enjoy. Right. Stay safe. And, yeah, I'll hopefully see you guys all in person sometime soon. Awesome. Love Thanks a lot, Mark. All the best, mate.